Welcome to Tilda Vision Ideas. Tilda Vision Ideas is a program that explores ideas and concepts in the following areas. Psychology, parapsychology, consciousness, ESP, dreams, spirituality, healing, creativity, quantum physics, business wealth, and the Word of God. Today's program is entitled Opting Out. And I have a panel of wonderful guests, each one talented, in, its, in his or her own right. Before I introduce them, I'd like to give you a brief bio, and Gigi Giuliani will present that part. Thank you. Our panel of experts tonight will begin with Janine Sop. She's a resident of Brooklyn and a parent organizer and founding parent member of Change the Stakes and New York City Opt Out, organizations that recognize that children are much more than test scores. She was one of the early opt-out parents in New York City that helped pave the way for the movement beginning in 2012. Her daughter, now in eighth grade, has benefited by not taking the test because the test prep and the pressure to test well would have definitely undermined her inherent brilliance. Janine herself is a ceramic artist who owns and manages a communal ceramic studio, Clay Space, 1205 in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. She recognizes the importance that arts and play in education and the growth and development of the whole child. Our second guest is Kamala Carmen. She's a resident of Brooklyn and has a seventh grader and a tenth grader in citywide public schools in Manhattan. Kamala's work in organizing public school parents led to the formation of New York City Public, a community engagement consultancy started with fellow parent Liz Rosenberg. New York City Public uses progressive education practices and design thinking protocols to reconnect public institutions like schools and libraries with their constituencies, the public. Kamala graduated from Oberlin College with a degree in classic archaeology. She later pursued graduate studies in documentary filmmaking at Stanford and after a long hiatus is returning to film production. Our third guest is Caliris Salas Ramirez. She's a Manhattan resident and a parent of a child in kindergarten. She is the co-president as well as the president of uh, President's Council in District 4, which means she is a member of the Chancellor's Parents Association and of the district leadership team. Professionally, she is a de developmental neuroscientist that has spent her whole career trying to understand why the developing brain is different than the adult brain and her efforts the last nine years have been on learning memory and emotional regulation. She combines those with her efforts to enhance diversity and inclusion in our student populations and standardized tests, provide only a limited view on potential success for students, particularly, particularly those of color or low socioeconomic status. And our final guest is Marcus MacArthur. He's a special education teacher at City S School, a transfer high school in Greenwich Village. He's a member of the New York State, um, I'm sorry, the school is a member of the New York State Performance Standards Consortium. He is also a representative for high schools on the UFT Executive Board and a member of MORE, M-O-R-E, which is Movement of Rank and File Educators. He is an advocate for teacher curricular autonomy and for de-emphasizing the role of standardized tests in public education. Thank you, Gigi. Okay, so let's get going with this panel. We entitled it Opting Out, and I asked Janine the question, opting out of what? Out of the tub? What are, we, what are we leaving, or what are we entering into? So Janine, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, the topic of, of opting out, as it, as it refers to this, is the New York State standardized tests that are given in grades three through eight. All New York State children are expected to take these tests, are mandated to take these tests, but in fact, parents do have the right to opt out, which means we can refuse to have our ch children take the state tests. Are there any consequences if the child does not take the test? No. None whatsoever? No. The, the law allows uh, children to be promoted based on their grades, their attendance, um, they can show their knowledge of the standards through a variety of means that do not need to include test scores. Why do you think that this test was created? Hmm. Well, I think the, 
the idea of standardized tests have been with us for decades. It was a way of ranking and sorting people into categories and um, was used by the military and so forth. So standardized tests have been in our, uh, in our world for a long time. The reason for these tests, I think probably for the same reasons, to uh, decide which children can move forward in their lives and which children uh, are ranked uh, a one, a two, a three, or a four. And parents like myself don't believe that that's the way children should be uh, ranked in their, in their lives. Children are much more than these test scores. I agree with you. Does anyone in the panel um, know the people that designed the tests? Well, I wanted to first just say address one address something. Uh, address something that Janine said when she said all students in New York State, grades three through eight, have to take these tests. It's actually not true. Private school students don't take these tests. I hear you. So, I think that's a really important point because it, it shows that that actually these tests aren't necessary to to indicate your level of education because. People who are wealthy enough or have scholarships to, to afford private school, they're automatically opted out. It's only public school parents um, who are faced uh, with this prescription that mm -hmm. their children must take these tests. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these particular tests that, um, that we are opposed to because they're high stakes. So it's not just that they're standardized tests because actually um, I mean, I can't speak for everybody here necessarily, but I know many of us don't necessarily have a problem with standardized tests if they're used for sampling purposes, for example. There is something called the NAEP, um, which is also called the Nation's Report Card, and that is given um, in fourth and eighth grade all over the entire country um, to different subgroups, but it's just a sampling of kids. It's not every kid every year, but that sample allows for some sort of comparison to look at how states are doing. But the idea of like every child having to take these tests every year between third uh, through eighth grade was a political decision it was. Um, okay. that was made uh, federally um, in the No Child Left Behind, which was um, um, promulgated by the Bush administration, and um, and that the, the rationale behind it originally was was not a bad one. The people what were, was it? Do you it recall? Was, it was that um, that there were big gaps in achievement uh, between students, especially students of color and especially uh, low-income students. And so there was some thought that um, by, by having these tests, you would um, be able to measure those differences and therefore um, force states into raising the, the, the level of education given to the students who had fallen, fallen behind. But, so that may have been a, a noble reason, but what we see more than 20 years later is not only does that gap between students persist, it's widened. So testing hasn't, hasn't done what it purported to do. And in which fact, was what? Which was to help narrow the, the so-called achievement gap. Um, between between specifically ha that was the, the haves and have nots basically. Mm -hmm. oh, Calaris, um, Caliris, what are your thoughts as to what you just heard and the opting out? Yeah. So you know, my son is still really young, so I'm fortunate to not have to face these kinds of decisions just yet. But it's something that I constantly think about because I have a lot of students that I admit into college programs, and this idea of taking a test and that test is going to move you forward in a particular direction. These tests were designed to, uh, to again, make an assessment. Are these schools working? Are these teachers working? And I'm sure Marcus can talk a little bit about that as well because teachers are also evaluated based on these test outcomes um, and sometimes have to even incorporate test prep, not sometimes, a lot of the times have to incorporate test prep into their curriculum um, to hopefully close this achievement gap. The problem with that is that one, we do have large companies that are making these tests. And so who are the people that decide what questions are gonna go in that test? And who are these people? Do, do we know them? Yeah. Okay, and are they Big. educators? 
For the most part, no. No, for the most part, <laughs> no. Most part, okay, no. I just want that word out there. Yes. Um, um, go ahead. So it's large companies, um, typically also affiliated to like textbooks and other educational tools that people can use. Um, so again, they're kind of in cahoots with each other. Um, and then these particular questions are, ch are chosen for children. And how are the questions chosen randomly? How are they chosen? How, how, okay, so we know already that the tests are designed by people right. outside of education. Mm -hmm. So who are the people then that are designing, that are making up these questions? Who are they? Do we know their backgrounds? Yes? Well, they're employees mm -hmm. of these large uh, for-profit companies mm -hmm. um, for years. Uh, Pearson, which is based in the United Kingdom, um, was the company that made the New York State tests. Um, we've now moved over to another company called Questar, which was recently bought by ETS, which is responsible for the College Board and the SAT. And so you will have some, definitely, people in those companies who are educators, but they're not in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, though, you also have people who are hired to write questions, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, to, or to score questions, which is even more important, in my opinion, sometimes off of Craigslist. Not yeah. in New York State. New York State has a prohibition against that, but in many states, that's mm -hmm. the case. Marcus, uh, how do you find these tests in the classroom? You are in the classroom. You're teaching special ed. Tell, talk to me. Are the special ed students exempt from the test, or do they have to take the test? Uh, special education students, uh, they have to take the test. They must. Um, okay. I'm, I'm working in high schools, and I've worked in two high schools, both of them alternative high schools, uh, which are schools where students will transfer from their uh, original high school because they need a different environment, might need more support, might need a fresh start because uh, the first school that they were in wasn't working out well. And the first school that I worked in was a school that uh, was a regents-based school, so students had to pass all five subject area regents exams in order to graduate from high school. Now I work in a school which is a consortium school where we do portfolio-based assessment. So in a portfolio-based assessment school, students get to work on projects that they develop with their teachers in their subject areas, and they only have to pass the English uh, regents exam. So that provides, in my perspective, and I think a lot of educators' perspective, more flexibility in terms of the type of activities that are done in a classroom and type of learning experiences that students have in a classroom. And it also uh, provides better assessment, I would argue, in the sense that you get to work and revise a project with a student over time. So if a student's at a low level, you can work with them to get to a higher level. Student starts out real high level, you can get them and you can push them to their highest capabilities Mark, and abilities. I have a question as you're speaking. Mm -hmm. um, have you administered the tests yourself in the yes. classroom? Have you been able to observe the children as they're taking this, these particular tests? The, am I correct, the core? Well, the problem is that he's a high school te uh, uh, teacher and so yes. he wouldn't be administered. The, the tests that we're talking about opting out of are the third through eighth grade tests. So, you so can't you, opt out of high school tests because they're a graduation requirement. Okay, so that's required. Yeah. Okay. Right, so that's right. So in the, in the high school context, we haven't seen opt out occur at the high school level mm -hmm. uh, at this point mm -hmm. um, because the stakes for, 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 for students at high school, there would be consequences. They wouldn't be allowed to graduate. Um, so there, there is um, a distinction between what's happening in elementary school and middle school and what currently is possible for high school. So nothing as radical as having students say that we're not going to take the Regents exam has happened yet or teachers saying that we're not going to administer these Regents exams. Now uh, obviously that, that would be uh, hugely controversial and significant if that did happen. For me personally, I don't see the, I don't see much validity in the Regents exams uh, uh, as, as currently constituted. I personally also don't uh, view standardized testing as being something that we should really have as an essential part of our public education system throughout the United States of America. And uh, the reason that I feel that way is just because 
is that th it's not real uh, teaching and learning. It's, it's like preparing for the SATs. It's not uh, taking the time to develop uh, skills or, or learning activities or projects that are real and would have a real audience and have meaning to the students, which I think is most important. Thank you. Thank you so much, I, Marcus. I uh, just want to add quickly, yes. though, that we do have students that we admit to our program that come from private schools or other schools that don't take the Regents exam. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm in a, on an admissions committee for a BSMD program. These kids are accepted into a medical program where there will be physicians within seven years. And we, we keep in mind this holistic perspective of, you know, what do their grades look like? What sorts of things have they done? And yes, we look at the SAT, ACTs, and Regents, but not all students take Regents exams, and those are one of the first ones that we're like, oh, they didn't take a Regent, no problem. Um, in addition, Harvard, two years ago, released um, a report basically saying that admissions, they're recommending admissions across the country to eliminate SAT evaluations really? and admissions Wonderful. for colleges because we have to keep in mind mm -hmm. that there are a, there is a diverse population of people that need to come into the workforce and need the college experience and should get the college experience based on who they are and what they could be. It's not a reflection of who they're going to be or whether they're going to be successful later on. This is also coming up in the higher ed level. So two months ago, the publication Science um, had, had um, a peer-reviewed article about how the GRE is not a reflection of whether somebody is going to be successful in a graduate program. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that the GRE specifically um, targets or affects people of color and people of low socioeconomic background in terms of admissions into a doctoral program. And so are we really taking in <coughs> individuals that are talented and can make a, a difference in society, again, based on a test? Thank you. Thank you so much, Calories. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I know that your child is, uh, is opting out, that your child is not taking the test. However, have you any information as to your child's friends, you know, or comments that the parents may have had as to those students that are taking the test. Have you seen um, any problems? From, from the parent perspective? Yes. I mean, I think that in, in New York City in particular, there's, there's a tremendous uh, hesitation from parents. Um, Why? Why is that? Well, for a number of years, the fourth grade tests and the seventh grade tests have been used for middle school and high school admissions. It's only recently, and I would say it's because of the opt-out movement, that, that those um, indicators have been uh, reduced in their importance so that um, things like report cards and uh, attendance and behavior have all been boosted. So if a child refuses the tests in, in those grades, there are other uh, measures that, that a school has to provide, and that's coming down from the Department <coughs> of Ed and New York State. Let's say your child opts out and is not taking the test. The other students are taking the test. What does your child do? Is your child placed in another classroom? Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, it really depends on the, the climate of the school. The principals have been um, asked by the Department of Ed to make accommodations for the children who are opting out. What, what sort of accommodations? So, it, um, for instance, in the school where, where my daughter went, we had it uh, at her highest grade um, an 85 or 90 percent opt out. So, the that's majority a large of the percentage. kids. Yeah, that's the majority of the students. So, in fact, the testing rooms were the smallest rooms and alternative. Uh, educational opportunities were happening to the majority of the kids outside of the room. There are some children in schools and, and uh, I would encourage all parents to consider opt-out no matter how many kids are doing it. If, if you believe that your child shouldn't be taking these tests, it's your right. And those accommodations could include sitting in, an, in the principal's office reading or drawing or, um, I mean, the idea being that more students wouldn't be taking than would be, and real education could be happening in those classrooms. Not six days of testing, 90 minutes each day. I, I would assume that if the child is taken out of that testing situation, that then the child could be exposed to uh, learning, yes. as opposed oh, okay. to just drawing, yes. right? Yes. 
I want to add, though, um, yeah, as president of the President's Council in East Harlem, again, I live in a community that 90% of the people that live in East Harlem live below the line of poverty, immigrant families. And I was sitting around the table about a month ago at directing this meeting, and I was like, oh, do you guys want to know about opting out? Central Park East won for the last two years. La two years ago, we had an 80% opt-out rate. Last year, we had a 68% opt-out rate. But that we are one of the few schools in East Harlem that actually has that happen. And the um, FACE representative that was at, at this meeting, um, FACE is from the Department of Education, Family and Community Engagement, as soon as I said that, she said, oh, but wait a minute. You guys have to be mindful that your children will not be accepted into several middle schools. And they put that fear into parents. Oh, yes? Is and that a fact? Is that a fact? It is not it a fact. It is not a fact. Not a fact. <gasps> and so, but wow. because, because they want to put that on parents, that pressure on parents. And who is they? The, the Department of Education in part. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that New York State uses those tests and those assessments to provide schools with money. And so if they don't have those assessments and those test scores, then it's much more difficult to justify why a school does certain things. Okay, so you answered the key question. Yes. Money. Money is money. driving all money. this. Okay, you please feel free to speak. Profit for profit This companies. is our program and we have yes. freedom of speech. Mm. Right, but I do want to make please. sure that, that that's not misinterpreted. Yes. Please yes. go because ahead. Because um, a lot of people do fear opting out because they, they, they think that their school will lose money if they opt out. Okay. And this is not in fact true. Um, there is Oh really? The school no. will not lose money. No, because people will say, well there's they say that if you fall below the ninety five percent, which is that, that a school should test ninety five percent of its students, um, that you're subject to lose money. But the point is that there have now been students opting out f in schools in New York for years. And nobody has lost a penny. Really? Nobody no. has lost a penny. It's, it would be political suicide if you think about it. If you're going to take, if you're taking away money from a school with a high opt-out rate and that school on kind of every other metric is actually is doing pretty well, well you yes. would look ridiculous. Okay. Right? And then if you took away money from like the poorest schools, that also is, doesn't make you look very good. Right. Now for, for the benefit of the viewers, how does the monies get trickled down to the individual schools? Does anyone on the panel know? Does anyone have that answer? What do you mean, which money? The budget? Well, the budgets. So, so how, is, how is that budget devised? How, how is it determined? Well, this school gets this amount, this school, based on what? Lots of different factors. How many students? Such as? How many students are in the school? What is the socioeconomic background of those students? Oh, that also gets absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, what are the needs? Um, what are the teachers? Are there quality teachers? Is it now? There's the term renewal school. Wait a minute. All of these quality teachers. Quality of teachers sometimes is one of the things that gets taken into Based account. Based on what? How is Based how is that on determined? Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marcus. Well, uh, in in, in terms of the question of funding. Um, it's, it's, it's many factors. Uh, the amount of special education students, that's another factor. Uh, special education students, depending on what uh, special education setting that they have, uh, could bring in more monies to, to a school. Um, but I, I wanted to get to this point of, for, for parents out there that might wonder, why am I going to opt my child out? They, they might think, uh, this is a test. This is an assessment. I'm going to find out how my child is doing. I'm going to find out if they're learning. Uh, I, think, I think it's important that we uh, respond to that question because it's, it's a valid question. It's a valid concern. It's, it's something logical that I think parents are thinking. I want to know how my child is doing. And I think one of the things that we have to explain to parents is that uh, standardized testing, it's is resulting in worse teaching practices happening in the classroom. It's resulting in people taking the assessments that students are going to have to perform more for standardized tests and making students do those type of assessments over and over and over again. Is this what you call uh, teaching to the test? That this Prep is what prepping we call the student, exactly. prepping the student to pass this particular test. Exactly. I have a question now. <laughs> Education is about learning. If the child takes that test, are they learning something? 
how to take a test. How to take a test. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just how to take the test. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they weren't taught anything about the test. Were they taught? Well, sometimes anything? they're taught like these very um, not higher or order thinking skills, like use process of elimination, answer questions so that you incorporate the question into your answer. So, which things, which I'm sure Kalirius can can attest to, because I have other friends who are who are uh, professors of education. Um, well, not just professors of education, professors who say that the high school students that they are getting now who have gone through their entire education in a test prep environment, their writing is so stilted, their, their, um, their creativity is stunted because, and everything they want to know is like, how do I know what to, like, tell me what's on the, what's going to be on, on the, the exam, exam so I know and, how to and study. And do, do the teachers know what's going to be on the exam? Oh, for the third through eighth grade yes, test? Yes, yes. Believe it or not, they don't. the teachers are not allowed to even read the test, if you can imagine. So they just proctor the test. They give out and they, proctor, they yeah. stand back. There's a gag, gag order on teachers to so, not talk about it. Oh, oh, I hear you. So that's different. They may look at it, but they're not allowed to talk about it. They're not even supposed to look at it. They're not they're supposed not. to read it. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And, okay. and like, like Kamala is saying, what, what, it, what we're creating is this culture of individuals, um, both in the teaching world and, and, and students that are just focused on these exams. And we're not talking about and we're not thinking about critical thinking, uh, problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning, collaborative learning. Um, and so they're moving in through this process. And what do we really know about the child or the, the person or who what they're going to become and how they're developing except for a number. I have, um, a, question. I have a question. Of the, okay, so the child is taking a test. Uh, okay, so the results, they can determine whether the child passed or did not pass. Is it that clear? Pass, fail? Is it that clear? Do, um, do they well, get a grade? Well, it's interesting. They, um, children are, are ranked as one, two, three, four. With um, By three, and four, three and four are considered proficient, one and two are not. Oh, okay. Um, however, what's very interesting is that they determine the score. It's not, it's not like taking a driver's test, right? Like, right. like to, when you, like there's certain things you need to know how to do, and if you can do those, you pass the test. You're actually compared to, the, to other, it's graded on a curve, so, so other students taking the test, so it's not like they're looking for an absolute level of knowledge. And... Um, it's those what's called the cut scores are determined after the students have already taken the test. So it's it's what is politically expedient. Mm -hmm. So if if it is politically expedient for the, for it to look like students are doing great, the scores will be higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's politically yeah. expedient to look like schools aren't doing so great, right. the scores will be lower. So it's very and subjective. unfortunately, that's where we are now because mm -hmm. there's a desire. You, okay, the way I always put it is like you can't sell the cure unless the patient is sick, and the cure and that talking, they want to sell. And talk, based on that, I have a question before you continue, and perhaps someone in the panel will be able to answer. D do you know if any studies have been conducted as to the child and the child's behavior vis-a-vis -vis the test? You know what effects, whether positive or negative. Do the children that take the test come away? How do they feel? What do they think about this particular test? Do you have any research well, findings? <coughs> I, I, can, I can speak to it from watching students uh, ha have to take standardized tests. And uh, I mean, I think the big thing that I see from the relationship that a lot of students have with the test is, is disengagement. Um, oh, it's, yes? It's not, it's not something that most students get excited about having to do really? in their education experience. Um, it's not something that uh, there's a great sense of enjoyment or accomplishment even when you come out and uh, pass the test. And it's not really one of those things that you're going to remember, uh, like if you do a great project in a class with me. Marcus, uh, I have to reintroduce the show. Thank you for watching Till Division Ideas. Uh, as you already know, Till Division Ideas is a program. Uh, we are live on Channel 34 for the year 2017. 
and we cover different areas, psychology, parapsychology, consciousness, ESP, dreams, spirituality, healing, creativity, quantum physics, business wealth, and the Word of God. We're always looking for talent. As you can see today, we have a lovely panel of educators and parents, and we're discussing education and test taking. But if you know how to sing, dance, play an instrument, if you're an artist, if you're a poet, uh, please call us, let us know. The number should be on the screen. Thank you so much. So Marcus, continue. I am so sorry. So. Well, I, I was just uh, saying that um, it's, it's, it's not an activity that uh, most students are going to find that much meaning in. And uh, there's a lot of activities that could be happening in school buildings and a lot of different work that could be done where they'll remember it the rest of their lives. Uh, Such as? So if you're, if one, of, one of the favorite things that uh, I like to do with students, uh, I'm an English and social studies teacher, uh, but in my English class, uh, my favorite project to do with students is writing a memoir. So I teach my students uh, the skills and the craft of uh, what great memoir essayists uh, do when they, when they write a great memoir essay, and then I'm asking them to write a story about their lives, something significant. Um, that they feel is important to them that they want to share with other people. That is and so valuable. Absolutely, and, um, and, and then we share those works with one another. They uh, workshop them with one another and go through the writing process. And they've written something that a real author would write. And they can share it with uh, people, and somebody's going to be touched. They are authors, and moved. unpublished. <laughs> they are. They are absolutely, yes, yes. positively That's authors. And uh, for a lot of students, that'll be an essay that they come back years from now and say, "Marcus, I'm so happy that you had us write that memoir essay in your class. Uh, that was the first time that I really enjoyed writing." That was the really nice. the first time that I thought of myself as a writer, and we're we're not doing that in mm. a in a standardized test. Wow! Thank so you so I, much, Marcus. In yes. terms of studies okay. that have focused like on you know whether the test is something positive yes. or or their experience, there haven't been as many when you're looking at uh, in terms of that question. But a lot of the questions have have been around why is it that certain people do better on these tests? and others don't, particularly children of color. And so one of the things that, that we found in the field of psychology um, is that children that are of color or live in impoverished conditions, there's already this stigma and there's already this perception attached to how am I supposed to perform on this test? So they're already thinking, oh, I'm supposed to fail. So when they take the test, it's not, the f it's not that they don't have the ability and or may not have been in a learning rich environment. It's that they have this particular stigma, mindset, stereotype, of mindset course. of I'm supposed to fail. And so if we continue to, to feed that by taking these tests, it's like feeding the monster. Uh, I thought I was supposed to fail and then I failed and so I'm going to continue to be a failure. And so again, what we're doing is that we're perpetuating this cycle. Another thing is um, uh, the principal and teachers of the elementary school that my children went to and that Janine's daughter went to, they um, do a, a talk where they show parents the questions that were on the tests and look at them. And there's definitely a bias against urban children really? because many of the questions are about like, you know, what happened down the down the lane, you know, in the farm and, you know, yes, whatever. Yes, they're yes. not, you know, they're not questions about your apartment building. <laughs> You know, they're you know they're 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 biased in in that way. But I wanted to add that even if you are someone who does well in these things and you feel good because you did do well in the test, and I was such a kid, <laughs> um, it's not helpful. It's not helpful in your actual life. I feel like I have to suppress some of those um, things that make me a good standardized test taker. Um, to be successful as, as an adult because what is needed is not, let me get that right answer. What's needed is I need to be able to listen to people. I need to be able to collaborate. I need to be able to uh, work in a way which is not figuring out which answer somebody wants that they've already provided, but how to ask my own questions in order to go forward. And these tests don't encourage that. And so even, even the children who do well on them 
I believe it is a disservice to them. Wow. To, I, I want to add that. a concrete and example to that because that's something that we're experiencing right now at our school, at Central Park East One Elementary School, that has been a progressive school traditionally for 42 odd years. And this last year we had a principal that is much more traditional and isn't supporting the progressive practices. And last year was the first time in years that our students actually underperformed in the really? state test where traditionally they overperformed you don't say. New York State standards. Wow. And now we have a huge dip, the lowest in the whole city. And so, again, when you take a child and when you take a person that's engaged in this learning process and exposed to this very enriched environment, and now you talk about test prep and you talk about what you have to do that day and how it's going to be, and those, all of those ideas start coming up on your, in your daily life as a child, that inhibits your ability of to be able to read and understand what these questions are and what the meaning of them is. It, it sounds like it produces a lot of stress. Absolutely. Too much. Yeah. Now I know that you have a, an art background. Now from, from that point of view, as a parent and your background in art, how important or, or where do you place the arts in education? Oh, I think they're at the center of education because I think children learn through creativity. We, we were born th through creativity. That's, that's the energy that we all live with. Um, what's, what's really unfortunate is because of the importance that these tests have placed, because of the test prep that schools and principals feel pressured to get their children up and running, performing, a good number of dollars are, mis are placed into the test prep machine and taken away from the arts. And I, I heard a, a number the other day that really overwhelmed me. Um, a principal came forward and she said that before the opt-out movement came to their school, they were spending $40,000 a year on test prep materials. And then she, she looked at the audience and she said, that's our music program. Wonderful. Right? So now they've been able to reallocate oh, those oh, dollars into music. Oh, that deserves an applause. Wow, Absolutely. that's yeah. wonderful, really. So when we think about New York State budgets being cut, when we think about class sizes growing, mm -hmm. um, we've got to think about what is that doing to the creativity of a child who, who, who can learn I I as an eight-year-old with 30 wow. kids in a classroom? And who, who wants to go to school when test prep is what you start with in September and, and with in May? Amazing, amazing. Yeah. It would be so wonderful if other principals from other schools adopted that point of view you know, and, and noticed the importance of the arts as opposed to just testing for what purpose. I mean, really, I'm, I'm listening and I'm attempting to what's the purpose of this whole thing? Now, I, I hear all of you and I see the problem, or at least I hear it. And so if you had a say in it, what would you do? What sort of solutions would you look for? And you, you used a word a little while ago that you had to suppress your ability to take tests, you know, because you wanted to relate and to be able to listen. Don't ever suppress anything. <laughs> well, I just, I just mean that, that, I that those, you. the focus on the s types of skills that make you a successful standardized test taker, I don't think are, are, are really the skills that make you a successful human being. Okay, so let's look for the, a possible solution, because I'm certain there must be so many little things. And if we add, you know how when you add one and one, it makes two. So talk to me about solving some of the problems. Does the problem begin with the pol politicians, with wealthy individuals, billionaires? I don't know. I'm asking. You know what, you as parents, you're doing something important right now and you're getting your word out there. That's very important. What else can be done? Well, um, my children go to a consortium school, which is the type of school that Marcus teaches in too. And mm -hmm. I think that is one thing that can be done. Um, the consortium schools are, um, they're kind of, they're an answer to opting out of the regents. That's how they came about. They were an alternative to looking at how you, um, they came about because there were certain schools that were successful in New York City 
then Commissioner of Education was looking at like, well, what do they have in common? And it was kind of a way that they worked with students in a very inquiry-based, project-based way. And that they looked at assessment as a place for students to grow and shine rather than to rank them and sort them. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, one so of the So this way ranking is like um, you're, you're tracking the student. You're putting them in tracks like little horses going to the races. Yeah. Okay. And so I think that this, um, this idea of looking at um, assessment more holistically like the consortium does is something that we need to try to expand. And there are uh, elementary schools through the, the PROS program, which is a New York City uh, program, that are, that are um, experimenting with consortium-like assessment on mm -hmm. the elementary level. Mm -hmm. um, those of us who are in 6 through 12 consortium schools would like a waiver for the middle schools as well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, but you know, there's, it's, it's not easy. It's not like a, just like a magic bullet because to, to do this, as I'm sure you know, to, to, um, to run a school this way and teach a school this way demands a lot of the teachers. Mm -hmm. It demands a lot of the students. It even demands something of the parents because yeah. you need parents to be there as uh, people who are supporting this this other way of assessing. So it, it's not easy, but it's but it's important that it happen. And so that's that would be one thing that I would say is to go more along that route of like a holistic assessment. Mm -hmm. Any yeah, ideas? To, mm -hmm, to piggyback off of uh -huh. what Kamala just said. Um, in a consortium school, the students are gonna do projects and then they're gonna present them. So in science, you'll do a science experiment and then you'll present your findings and your research uh, to, to an audience. In social studies, you'll uh, do a research project on some question that you might have about history or a social phenomena that's occurring in, in, in a society around the world and then you're going to write a research-based paper with an argument that you're going to prove with, with evidence and support with evidence. So all of that is a, a natural and more meaningful learning process where you get to collaborate with your teachers, you get to collaborate with your classmates, you get to revise and fix mistakes that you make along the way, and then you get to share your knowledge um, with, with other individuals. So that just, it, it's, it's uh, more useful. Those are more useful skills for somebody to have in the real world. The ability to do research, the be ability to correct your work when you make mistakes, the ability to work with other people, the ability to, to speak and present your knowledge. Um, with the consortium, uh, for me, since I'm somebody that really values teacher autonomy, I would go even further than w w what the consortium consor offers uh, because there are rubrics and there are certain guidelines that we have to follow in terms of what a project has to consist of. So for example, I'm an English teacher. Um, they have to write a literary essay about literature. My memoir project won't count. But to me, that memoir project is just as valid as any literary essay that they're going to write. Or I like to do creative writing in my classes. Maybe I'll have them write a short story. That short story won't count because it has to be an analysis of literature. So what I'm arguing for is even more teacher autonomy than even what the consortium offers because there's a lot of really rich and powerful work that teachers that really want to innovate in the classroom can be doing, but at this point it, it won't count. It's just a nice project, but it doesn't count to demonstrate mastery of, of content uh, to graduate and move on uh, to college. Okay, uh, Color, if you so, were gonna say something. Yeah, a, a couple things, absolutely. Like you have um, these teachers that uh, have the, could have the ability to engage their students in multiple ways and creative ways. Um, we like to call it emergent curriculum, right? You learn what the child likes, you figure out creative ways to teach them all of these things that they need to learn as throughout their trajectory. And, and we have to figure out a way, one, how to support the teachers to, in doing that. We have to do it as parents because they also need to learn from us about our child. So we need to engage in an active conversation with, with our teachers. Um, but also 
supporting them in the school when they do have an administration that isn't supporting them in doing this type of stuff and supporting them politically. So in terms of now, now we have this Secretary of Education that has really interesting perspectives on how school should be and what they should do. Um, we have to go out there as parents and say, this is what our children need. They need to be in an environment where they're supported and where they can be creative, where they can be empowered, where they can be productive citizens in society. Um, and so we have to engage in those conversations actively. We have to talk about, and there already has been a legislation passed um, in New York City that now teachers have to engage in professional development around culturally responsive pedagogy. So thinking about where the kids come from, um, what sorts of things they need, what's happening, in, what's happening at home. I also want to add that in terms of having problem-based learning um, and active, engaged learning in the classroom, this is something that we do at a higher ed level. So if we're not, if we're not having children that are going through a K through 12 environment that are engaged in that type of thinking, they're going to have a really tough time once they come to college, and they're going to have an even tougher time if they want to go into higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, plain and simple. That transition is going to be really, really difficult because, again, they're going to be thinking about what do I need to do to get this test. So as parents and as teachers, we have to come <coughs> together against an administration that inhibits that type of rich learning oh, environment. Oh, that's very difficult to go against, to go, to challenge the administration? Challenge Oh, my challenge. gosh. Oh, I mean, you're putting your job on the line. <laughs> Janine. Um, that's why parents have to stand up. <laughs> yes, I hear you. Yes, the parents. <laughs> Make it easier on the teachers. Yeah. But do you have any comment? Any Absolutely, to add? I do. Please, go ahead. Absolutely, because my, my partners here have, have just laid out that we actually have many answers to this, this yeah. question that you asked, yes. right? And private schools have these answers. Child going through private school education never even sees one of these tests. What did they do? They refused to participate in them. It's the same thing that public school parents need to do. If we want a different model, and I think all of us here feel that the model that we have, though there are some good things that are happening in our public schools, there could be so much more. And there are so many models that we could choose from. Oh yes. But until we deny the data of these tests, and we have to remember that every child that takes the test has just put their log on the fire of the data collection. And that data is what drives the policy. So if we throw a wrench in the engine, which is called opt-out, mm -hmm. and we say, not with my, not with no, my, with my child, child. Not, okay. you're not, I'm not going to give you my child's data, I'm not going to participate in a system that, that is stepping on our children. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we really need to get serious about what this is doing to the child. What is this doing to an eight-year-old yes, who's that developing self-esteem, yes. who wants to make mistakes and learn from them? Yes. I mean, we're teaching our kids that there's no such thing as a mistake, right? If you make a mistake, you've done something wrong. As an artist, every mistake that ever comes up in the work that I do fuels me to a new direction. That's right. That's, right. That's how we learn. We learn through mistakes. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, on one hand, we're telling children there's one answer to this. When we know in the 21st century world, there are many answers. So the idea of collaboration, the idea of creativity, the idea of uh, assessments that are holistic, where a teacher can sit down and, and really get to know the student. Because we want to know, where are the weaknesses? How do you identify weaknesses? These tests don't do that. You know, nobody said it, but the, the grades of these tests don't come in until the following summer. So you're able to see the grades eventually? Just a number. That's a, all a you number. get. You can get a little bit more of breakdown if you go and uh, request um, through a From certain who? portal. Um, there's, I think, at the New York City Students Account. I don't know. I haven't actually done it because my children don't take the test. Uh -huh. But okay. but you you can get some more information than just the one, two, three, can four. Can you get that, uh, but that information out? Um, for the, for the I guess ask your ask your principal how you do it. But the point is that you'll never get complete information, even if you get more than just the one, two, three, four, for a number of reasons. The biggest one of which is that the um, the state does not release all of the questions. So you might see some answers, but you'll never see all of the questions. They don't release the multiple choice questions. They only let you see some of the short answer questions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's impossible to really get a read on it, you know, if, if, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, so you end up with just a number, and right. Right. right, and it's, and it's you know, Makes people no say that, like, how will you know how your child is doing? How yeah. will the teacher be able to do this? So I was like, that's why we have parent-teacher conferences. That's why we have, um, would, would you know, me so much written comments on their work. You know, it's be, we read that, and that's how we know. And it's interesting, my, my uh, younger daughter um, took the test in third grade. That's the only year she's taken it. But I was very curious to see w how the test would read, because I know my daughter very well. She's um, some parental bragging, but she's an amazing writer. Okay. okay so, her, so for example, her fourth grade teacher, who was a smart woman, we went to the same college, um, mm -hmm. she said, I don't even know what to tell you about her. She writes better than I do, you know, and she's in fourth grade. And so I was thinking, like, I'm very curious to see how this test is going to get her with verbal versus math, because, um, you know, ELA versus math, because, um, She's not a terrible math student, but math doesn't come as easily to but her I understand as you writing. ELA versus math, right? So there's an ELA yes. score, right, and a math score. And I right. was, and I know that if I know my child, she's a like she has much greater facility with ELA, ELA. Okay. than she does with math. Okay, she had pretty good scores on both, but which one do you think was higher? Wow! Don't tell math. me math. Math really? and she like oh. math is just not you know but it's you reminded you because you said she's an just, excellent writer you reminded me of something uh, I taught with the board of ed mm -hmm. for the city of New York for fourteen years and I was told don't be a creative writer on your essay just write simple sentences the noun the verb and the object and that's it. And well, I because scored. they have like two minutes to like correct the entire thing, so they don't, you know, the SAT so is, is I, I the same. So I stayed away but. from being creative, but maybe perhaps something similar happened to your daughter. I don't know, but her math score was higher than the other. Right. That's I mean, my point is not so, is is just more that like that test could not tell what anybody with even just passing knowledge of right. her could tell you. So it mm. so it didn't help. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, Janine and I were talking earlier. Um, we have a friend who, uh, whose children go to one of the highest rated elementary schools in Brooklyn. And they did an anonymous survey of their teachers to, to ask of the their teachers. Teacher, of the okay. teachers to say, do the tests return helpful information to you that can help you move your students forward? And, and of the 28 teachers that answered, not one, one. said that they gave, gave them useful information. Okay, I hear you. So, and, and well, so why they, are we doing how this? How could they really? Because they don't have access to the test. They don't have access really to any legitimate results. So how can they gauge? How can they comment? And again, it's such um, limited. But why do you think that the teachers are kept in the dark? You know, they, I, I can't figure that out. Well, that, the that, teachers are there to teach. So yeah. instruct, teach the teacher so they can be, become more effective. I don't understand. I really don't. Why the, why the, they can't I don't see understand the why the teachers are being kept in the dark, why they don't have access to the test, why they don't have an input. W w I don't understand. I mean, if, if teachers are to teach, mm -hmm. right? And because education it's not about teaching, it's about sorry. money. Yeah. Thank it's you. A, it's, a, it's a for profit industry. Yeah. So Thank they don't you. release the test questions because then they would cost more to make more. It's yeah. all, it's all, yeah. it's not about it's actually teaching anything. Yeah. Janine, you had a also, thought? Uh, Janine, I mean, in some ways I would say, let's not throw more money at these tests. You know, okay. I, though I don't like the fact that the teachers can't see the test questions, I think even by, by doing that, we're suddenly validating this. I, I think that we should heed the, the wisdom of our uh, New York State Education Chancellor Betty Rosa, who said, "If my kids were in public school today, she would not let them take these tests." Wow. So, you know, that's the wisdom of a teacher, a superintendent, and now our school's chancellor that that recognizes that these tests really don't measure. And can I say that you know who else said that? Carmen Farina. Oh, thank you for but mentioning. But not in public. Not in public. <laughs> she said it in a closed door meeting. Which but somebody how, recorded. Somebody, oh my. Surreptitiously. And the fact that she would say in a closed room, that especially for children who are English language learners, mm -hmm. that it is wrong to make them take this test. I would and think And yet so. does not come out publicly, even though the city council in 2015 
pa unanimously passed. So every single city council member passed this resolution that said parents have the right to opt their children out of these tests, and the board of the the Department of Education should incorporate that incorporate this into a parents' bill of rights, and it should be passed out in September to every parent of a child in the New York City public education system. I don't know. I have, I the have, DOE has never done it up until I, now. I have a, a bit of a suggestion. Uh, I don't know what Carmen Fiorina is doing right now, but perhaps you should befriend her. I'm sure she has some power and, and some pull. Uh, it's not, no, no. <laughs> it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of trying. I think you're talking to the wrong audience. <laughs> no, her, I mean, the way she has put it out is that, that our children need to, to be challenged. They need to be up for the challenge. And, and we would argue that our children well, I mean, are challenged yeah, in so cha many other ways that that's are right. real I challenges. Mean, don't challenge me to fly with my, my arms. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's a challenge. <laughs> but I, I know I won't be able to do it. And so what will that do to my self-esteem, to my sense of worth? And I'm saying even if you can do it, what's the point? Right. Yeah. What's, what's the end? And like she's, one of the things that she's always saying, her tests are a part of life. I'm sorry, I'm in my 50s. I can't remember the last time I took a test. They are not a part of my life, you know? And I know there's some professions where you take tests, but there are many, many where we don't take tests. The only time, you know, the last time I took a test, I don't think I even took a test in graduate school. I took a test in, in college, probably. But you know, they're not... They're, they're, they're a part of life if you think of life as like reality television where you have to constantly do challenges or be sent to the basement to like, you know, shuck the, the oysters or something. But like, but <laughs> shuck them. Okay. Well, you know, whatever the punishment is for some, you know, cooking show or something. But, but like, but in real life, that's not, we're not constantly being given this challenge where one person wins and the other person loses. It's not like that. Right. We, 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 we really have to recognize that the tests are serving a very big political purpose for a lot of people in our society <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for politicians, they like to use it to say, oh, test scores are going up or they're going down, depending what their ideological agenda is or what their electoral goals are for the moment. Um, for corporations, they want to prove that the public school system is failing. So they want to use these tests to prove that Teachers are no good, so they can get rid really? of Really? Is that a fact? Is so that a fact? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have, mm -hmm. I have a minute left. A, a, a thought that perhaps you didn't say, uh, something you want the, the audience to, to, uh, to know. Yeah, I mean, it has to be seconds. Okay, so it's, opting out is a really easy thing to do. You can visit our website, optoutnyc.com. There's a how-to opt-out video. It's the best thing you can do for your kid. Okay. Second. Uh, I, I, okay. Would, I would agree. You can, um, there's a letter template on that website, or you can just write a simple email or note and make sure your principal Thank you. and teacher get it. Support your school, support your children, and give them the best enriched environment because they're going to be successful. Thank you. So I want to thank my panel. Uh, you were wonderful. I didn't want to interrupt. Everything was lovely. I am so happy, delighted. I learned a lot. So thank you for watching Till Division Ideas. Bye-bye now.